Our guest today is a fellow Yorkshire leg spinner. She made her debut for the White Rose as a 16-year-old and has gone on to play for Northern Diamonds and is also due to play in the debut season of the 100 next year for the Northern Superchargers. In 2019, uh, she was also voted the Guardian Women's Cricketer of the Year. Welcome to the Spin Badger podcast, Katie Levick. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Good to have you on, Lev. Um, so I guess like something to start with is, you know, you're taking 190 wickets for Yorkshire and you're the all-time leading wicket-taker in the Women's County Championship, but not played for England. I read a few bits and bobs like, around it, but I just wondered, like, from your perspective, like, you know, what's the full story there? Like, you know, how come, you know, you never never played for England or I guess haven't played for England yet, maybe? Yeah, I suppose it's all just circumstance, really. Um, when I was in the younger setup um, and was playing the regional stuff and um, the Junior Super Fours was a tournament you used to play um, where they'd pick the best 50 girls um, in the country and you'd play a tournament and that was how they sort of selected the England stuff. I just never really progressed on from that. Um, and I always got wickets in those tournaments and I think I realised at that stage maybe our face just didn't quite fit or wasn't just sort of um, in their plans at any stage. So I sort of ignored that part of cricket for a while for me and just focused on Yorkshire. Um, I then did get in the England Academy when I was at uni and I spent a couple of years in that. Um, but then real life called again and I had to get a job um, and realised I couldn't keep giving up so much free time and needed to support myself and not rely on my parents so much. Um, so I made that decision to pull myself out of the system and then it's just never really been a, a thing to go back in and um, at least it allowed me to play a lot of cricket for Yorkshire and have other experiences so I have no regrets in them terms that um, England maybe wasn't for me but you know I've had a fulfilling career other way. Yeah definitely I guess um, just from like the men's game like really lucky with how professional it is and you know if you're at that kind of standard like you know you're probably going to be looked after financially. So, like, on that note, like, is it exciting for you now that uh, there's a bit more kind of, or moving towards, I guess, more equality in the women's game and there's a lot more, like, professional opportunities for cricketers? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's always been largely amateur. It still very is largely amateur. This is the first year that we've got any form of domestic contracts and um, you give up so much time for your sport, like all club men's cricketers know, and you do it for the love of the game, but we were doing it for the White Rose as well in between. So it always felt a bit um, unfair of sort of a ways that I always said to my parents, I want to play until I got paid. Like, I want something to come back from cricket. You know, all these hours I've spent, um, I think I deserve a little something. And we're getting to that stage now. The Super League was partly professional, you know, for a month, a year, and then the regional stuff is going in the same direction. So it's nice that we're getting to the stage of where girls can genuinely see it as a career option going forward even if it might not be my career option um it's definitely getting better for the future generations no it's good i think it's a really exciting time for the women's game and i think like you know you must have had must have been very committed over the years because i'm hearing stories about like you know for women's county cricket like you might have you might i'd be playing somerset away and then have another away game the next day you know so you're spending all your i guess your time off from work which you have to do you know just traveling and and um, yeah, just trying to get to the, the various fixtures. Yeah, I've not experienced a bank holiday weekend, I think, since I was about 13, because that's when you get all your fixtures in for Women's County. So you play Sunday, Monday, back to back, and it is usually away. So it is usually Somerset, Kent, Sunday, Monday. What hours can I get back to then go to work at 9 a.m. Tuesday? So yeah, it's usually a slog. The county grind, I'm sure you're familiar. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I guess we don't know how lucky we are to have it um, like we are, like we do in the men's game. Um, you know, and I guess it's great that it's heading in that direction. I know from spending a bit of time in Australia, like they're really, um, you know, the women's game there's um, heading a lot more professional. You know, I think they have, is it, um, you know, fully professional squads in each state and stuff. So it'd be great if if more steps can be taken to end up with that over here. Yeah, they're definitely the the leaders in the world of women's domestic cricket, and they did the, did it at first, and I think they've shown now in their international setup that they're just all dominating and a force to be reckoned with and I think it shows that you need that investment at the lower levels to see the rewards at the highest level and I'm glad we're finally following it uh, we are a few years behind but at least we are doing it now yeah I think you know they obviously played brilliantly in that uh, last women's um, world t20 so you know hopefully the ECB takes note and 
and there's a lot more opportunities for young female cricketers. Um, so moving on to like your own game, Lev, like obviously um, you're a leg spinner. What, you know, what type of bowler are you? you know, what are your strengths? You know, what, what do you think makes you, has made you be success, successful as you have? Um, I think first and foremost, I spin it uh, without being really big headed. I think that's something that sometimes gets forgetting in, in spin bowling. And I, I'm always proud of myself on that. I do turn it big. And I think um, there's nothing better as a spinner than when you get it to absolutely rip. And um, my accuracy as well. Um, I can, I'm can. i very confident in myself and I, I've probably done it for years. I know I can pitch the ball anywhere I want on a pitch straight away. Um, and over the years, I think that's got my wickets more than any variations or anything is that batters have come to acknowledge that I'm probably not going to give you a bad ball. So you're going to have to go after my good ones. And that's exactly what we want them to do as spinners. Um, so I think, yeah, just my accuracy um, is my main asset for sure. That's good to hear. And then, so what do you think makes you so accurate? Is it just, you know, loads of repetitions of bowling over the years? Is it something in your action? You know, what do you think it is? I think, um, well, anyone that's seen me bowl knows I've got a very natural action. Um, it's not orthodox in the slightest, but it's naturally what my body does. And I just, yeah. I can replicate it. There's absolutely no change in it, ball on ball. Um, and obviously volume, you know, all spinners know you end up being the bowling machine and training more often than not. And I just have so many overs under my belt. And, you know, in the diamond setup, they call me Merlin because I'll just set me up in a lane all day and go all day. And um, I think that's just the most important thing for a bowler, um, especially a spinner, is just get so many overs in your shoulder that come game day, you're not worried about where it's going to go because you know I've bowled 30 overs already this week and it's gone absolutely fine. So that's always my thing. I just bowl as much as physically possible. And there is always many a willing batter to face a spinner, especially a leg spinner. So um, I get plenty of practice. Definitely. That's good to hear. I think that's a real uh, common message from everyone that I've spoken to. And I think as spinners, we're lucky that, you know, we can bowl all day and touch wood. You know, we don't pick up too many injuries. Like if you're a seamer and did that, you'd probably break down at some point. So I think that's a real plus for any um, young spinner listening that, that we have the ability to do that. Yeah, I mean, if anyone's seen my action, you'd be amazed and I've never been injured. Everyone thinks I must have pulled my shoulder out of the socket or elbow must have popped out at some stage. But it hasn't and it's just because it's what's natural to me and it's easily replicable rep, whatever that word is <laughs> uh, repeatable yeah, yeah, we'll go, yeah. <laughs> um, um and yeah i know it's not putting a strain on my body and i can just do it over and over again and we're lucky in that way and i like to take advantage of being able to do that yeah so like, has that always been your action like, you know the first time you ever tried bowling bowling at all or even just trying to bowl leg spin was that just how you bowled yeah yeah um the first time I ever played cricket, I just went and joined the youngest session at my local club and just did what all the other kids did and ran in and bowled it. And um, the coach asked why it was coming out of the back of my hand and I had no clue because I was about nine what that meant. And um, he said, look, don't run in. It's coming out of the back of your hand. You're, just, you're bowling legs spin naturally and I genuinely can't do anything else. I think that's one of the reasons I've never wanted to go into coaching is because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> it is just my body's just doing it. Um, and I'm lucky that it does come out of my hand naturally. Obviously, I've then worked on it over the years and I can do it more pronounced and stuff and doing it on purpose. But equally, when you get to that stage of a net and you want to run in a ball seam for a bit, I'm just bowling cutters out of the back of my hand still. It's just something that's natural to me. So when, like, when you're younger, you're talking about um, you know, being involved in, in youth club cricket. You know, what was your journey like? Did you just play um, with boys when you were that age? Like, what, you know, what was your kind of pathway? Yeah, so um, I think it's pretty similar to everyone in that I had an older brother that played. Um, I had to go and watch everything he did. And um, the junior session was happening at the same time as his training. I just went and joined it. It was all the boys, obviously. Um, but also throughout my brother's age group junior cricket there was always a girl in his team so I was always just thought that is what I will do I'll play in the boys teams there wasn't any girls teams around that I knew of anyway um so I just always just joined in with my local club they were so accommodating and great with me and um played throughout all my junior cricket in men's and boys um the only women's cricket I played as a junior was represented represented cricket because there wasn't a club, so I just got stuck straight off into the South Yorkshire and the Yorkshire set up because um, that's what just was around. And 
I didn't join a women's team until I was about 16 and I purely joined that because I was in the Yorkshire first team and they said you know you should be probably playing club cricket as well with us so I joined a women's team then but that came after making my first team debut which seems a weird way around doing it but it was just the opportunities back then that's how it was. And do you think that almost helped you like you know bowling at boys and um, especially as they you know got older and stronger like, and I think as a le- as a leg spin right was that something that helped you in terms of like improving your skill levels? Absolutely I think I'm um, the biggest advocate for with girls and um, playing with the lads it just makes you a better player I know it certainly made me a better player um, I joined the second team when I was 13 because they needed a spinner um, and I they thought I was the best spinner in the club regardless of gender and so I went along and men will hit you further than any girl or boy I'd face at that stage. And it made me a better bowler in terms of physiologically, men are just stronger. That's just how it is. And they can hit me to the boundary with little skill and it doesn't take technique. You know, if they want to just muscle me to the boundary, they will. And so then I had to start thinking more about what I was bowling and come up with plans and stuff. And then going over to women's cricket, I probably didn't enjoy it as much as men's cricket because it especially at the junior levels, it wasn't as much as a contest. It was, you know, we don't didn't play the best standard of cricket at junior Yorkshire, and so I didn't feel like I was getting tested there. Um, I, whereas I could go and bowl 16 overs for the men on a weekend and have to think throughout my entire spell and um, really figure out batsmen rather than just hoping that my best ball will get them out like I used to do with women's. Yeah, definitely. It's probably a great, great learning curve, and I think that's the same in any walk of life, you know, if you're doing something that's challenging you and you can you can work out a way for it you know when you go back to your own level like it's, you know you're probably gonna feel like you've improved like I remember like even when you know I started playing a bit of like decent stand university cricket and second level county cricket and you go back to club cricket you know you feel like you've improved whether you have or not you know you just go back to that standard and you feel like you're a better bowler so and I guess same bowl on the nets you know you're always going to bowl at the best players because that's the best way to improve so that's probably a re- real key message for any any young spinners yeah, definitely. If you're not testing yourself, you're not wanting to get better, what are you playing for, ultimately, I think? Definitely. Love that. Um, so, so, we'll talk about this a bit later, but I guess we kind of touched on it already, and that's like kind of the difference in like women's and men's cricket, um, just in general, but also like in spin bowling and as a spin bowler, like, you know, do you think that they're, they're the same game? You know, they set up differently? You know, what, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, in the men's cricket I've played, um, I played to a fairly decent club level standard, but I think their get out shot usually is the big old heave of a cow. Um, whereas women, you can tell, and it's a lot more specific to each batsman. You have to do, I find I have to do a lot more analysis in terms of what are their strengths and weaknesses because um, they're not just going to muscle you as they get out of jail shot. And, you know, you need to set up plans and you need to make sure you've got your fields in the right way to be cutting off their scoring options, which is then going to free up your wicket option. Um, I think the playing against the men another thing also is you're allowed more fielders out for men's cricket um, so you can only have four out in women's which is a big difference and yeah, definitely. I remember play, the first year of the Super League when I was playing for the Diamonds and I went back into my office and the, one of the guys was like why did you only have four out like get another out and oh, it's, cause I, oh, it's all I could have like yeah. <laughs> if I could have five I would absolutely th- definitely have five but makes you think a bit more you know you've got to be more strategic you can't just cover as a whole and think I'm just gonna pack all outside and hope you have to be a lot more specific in giving them an open shot to then try and entice them to the shot you want um so it's a lot more tactical the women's game I think um but bowling at the men makes made me a better bowler anyway because um even your good balls can go with them um a lot more frequently than in the women's game um so it just makes you more of a thinking cricketer I think Definitely. You, you spoke there about only having four out. Like, I guess my main experience of that has been in, in 50 over cricket in the middle where, you know, you're not far out the rig. And I think it, it, although it's more of a challenge for us, like, it does make it really, um, you know, really interesting. And you touch your own analysis. Like, I always think, for me, T20 analysis is pretty straightforward. You know, it's do they reverse sweep or not. And then, but then 50 over cricket, when you have that extra um, player in, you know, is really you have to be really sure about what their strengths are. So like when you're doing analysis, what kind of things are you looking for? Yeah, definitely um, where they predominantly hit um, and what 
which bowlers you predominantly get them out. You know, there's a lot of opportunities in us only playing small, um, limited overs cricket in that I might be asked to come on a lot earlier in a game than you normally would and be expected to bowl in the power play. So it's about having those plans in place when you can only have two out. And then also when you move on to four, I'm quite an attacking bowler in that if I don't have to have four out, I won't. And I'd like them to try first. Um, I always mostly will have my straights up um, to say, like, try and hit me down there, lass. I bet you can't. And then they usually do. But um, I like to not have a defensive plan A. I like my plan A to always be attacking. Um, and if you can go into a game having already got some analysis on them. Obviously, the women's game, we don't have that much analysis at the moment. It's getting, we're building up a bank, having played the Super League for a few years now. Yeah. So it's getting mm -hmm. easier to see some more um, regularly. But also with the women's game being so um, tight-knit, generally someone in the team has played against them regularly and you're usually friends with quite a lot of the other teams. So your meetings will be sat around being like, right, who's played with this girl? What can you tell us? And you just share it all that way. Um, so I think they're really important for a young bowler. So you're not just going in and thinking, I always ball this ball. Um, I'll try that again now. It's having plans to players. And I like to think that a batsman would get frustrated knowing straight away if they like to sweep and your sweeps have gone out and they've covered that and they've, they've got to then instantly go to their plan B. So it's just a first little um, mini battle before you've even started bowling. If you can tell that they've set of field specifically for you I think yeah I love what you're saying there about talking to your teammates I think you know not all the listeners will be lucky enough to have access to like you know full video analysis but I think that's a simple thing you can do is if you're planning it if you're playing against someone you don't really know what they do even like when they're walking out to the middle when you take a look at all right has anyone played against this player you know what do they do those kind of conversations can really make a difference um and like I said you probably still have your own plan a as a bowler like so for you Lev you're talking about the power play like would you have two fielders you'd normally have out in the power play? Um, I usually have extra in cow or square, depending on if they're a sweeper or not, um, just to cover both bases of both sides. Um, and I know that, as I touched on earlier, that I can probably ball it where I want to. So I, do, I feel like I don't need the ex like quite a few legs to start with two on the leg side for the ones that drift down legs and actually get them into the spell. Whereas I would rather... Um, ball and attacking line and get you driving me and just taking your one out through to um, cover. Yeah, definitely. Um, so on that analysis as well, like it seems just from, you know, when I've watched women's cricket and stuff, it seems like a lot of the batters are really skillful and have a lot of options. So a lot of them like reverse sweep, paddle sweep, like do you find that that's the case, I, I guess, compared to like when you've bowled at um, male players, like you said, they just try and slog you out of Parker. A woman's bat is like a lot more skillful and so you kind of have to cover those shots a bit more. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just from being in and around the environment, um, not necessarily being one of the bats that does it, but you constantly have to adapt your game. And, you know, the main thing that we all want to be is try and play 360 because it's so difficult to be a one-dimensional cricketer because in women's cricket, I think you'll just get found out. If you if you can just drive, I can block that off and then, then you are stuck. So I do think... Um, the reverses and the more innovations had to come into the women's game because we can't just muscle it to, to the boundary. You need those options. Um, so I certainly think that it causes a few more headaches as a bowler in the women's game, you know, knowing that someone's got that in the locker. Um, but it's about, like we touched on earlier, talking to teammates and you can be usually at the level where you say they've just started um, they pull out the occasional reverse or they pull out the occasional this and then you think right well I'm going to make them do that then because it's still only an occasional option for them that is exactly what I want them to do because it's not going to be their strongest shot so you know you'll open up a gap and say look here's mid wicket open you know try and get me through there I know you can't or you know only having your one point in saying I've seen you reverse once it didn't go to plan you know like try it that um so it's yeah it's about um it's just really knowing your batsman, I think, is the main thing from me. Definitely. And then if someone is like, well, for both, sweeping and reversing, like, how are you, say if they're um, pretty good at both, like, how do you adapt to that? Will you change, like, how you bowl and your pace or lines? Or is it just a case of putting the fielders there? Yeah, um, it's just, I suppose it's just a case of putting the fielders there. I think one of the main things that I've learned and all that I got told was, you know, batters are allowed to play good shots just as much as you're allowed to bowl a good ball. 
and not letting that affect you, you know, because um, I know that nine times out of ten, I can bowl my best ball. I don't trust that you can do that with your best shot. So I'm going to eventually win this battle. So I always just back myself and back my skills. And if a batter makes you change your plan, then they've won. So I always just stick to what I know I can do and know I can do best. And I know I'll eventually win that battle. <laughs> Love that. I know that we were joking around yesterday and you were saying you listened to a few of the episodes and I think from the Stream McGill one, you know, that's that's his whole mantra about that. Bowl your best ball is, you know, even if you bowl your very best ball and, you know, it gets hit out of the park or whatever happens, like, that can't keep happening. So I guess it's almost being patient in in backing, you know, what you do. And I think, like, just knowing your little 11, even spin today, like, you can tell how, how much self-belief and confidence you have in your game. So I think that's a real key takeaway for people listening you know is you just have to be patient and, and back what you're doing yeah I think as a spinner the earlier you can realize you're going to go around the park that is just inevitable and you've got a thankless task the better um you can't let that affect you too much it's about what you do next it's always about what you do next definitely love that I was actually I, like on a complete separate I was actually listening to a golf podcast yesterday um shock and they were saying like oh, a really good mindset is just to be like right this you know everything happens from point A. So like, right, the next shot is something new. It's, you know, I'm going from point A. There's no kind of um, baggage about what's happened. Like, you know, so if you bowled a bad ball, you know, at the top of your mark, you're not thinking like that. You are concentrating on the next ball and thinking about, right, this is a fresh opportunity to, you know, bowl your best ball, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, I always just think what's happened can't be edited and can't be changed. So why dwell on it and why let that affect what's going to happen next, you know? Just, just focus on the next. Definitely. Um, so going back to you as a bowler, Lev, you know, you said your big strengths are spinning it and being accurate, which are probably the two best strengths you can have. But you know, I was curious. Do you have any, um, do you have any like variations, like you know, and if you do, like how do you bowl them? I mean, I wish I could say yes, but I feel like this is where I'm a fraud of a spinner in that I don't have any of the traditional variations. I'd say, um, like I touched on earlier, because my action is so natural. I found it really difficult to replicate what when people tell you, oh, this is how you bowl a googly and this is how you do that because my wrist isn't doing what theirs is to start with. Um, and also, I think going back historically, women's cricket didn't tend generally have the most niche or great coaches. You know, you had fantastic people that, you know, that helped the game and got us, got us a game on, you know, but it doesn't mean they were ne- necessarily the less technical coaches that could help me in that side of the game. So it was something I'd thought right I'm not gonna have any variations unless any batters are listening I've got loads of variations yeah obviously um, <laughs> you've got to sell that. yeah yeah 10 different balls. Um, but I just focused on other things in the flight and speed uh, my variations and you know they're what I'll control and um like I said earlier that I really worked on my accuracy and thought right okay if I can make my best ball almost unplayable they're gonna have to start playing that eventually if that is just all I keep chucking down and um, so that's where I get most of my variation from in terms of flight and, and speed and where I'm pitching it really. Um, I wish I had proper variations, maybe one day, but um, yeah, it's just about adapting to knowing that I wasn't going to pull out mystery balls every ball. Um, I'm not going to have them in my armory, so making sure that my best ball is just the best. Definitely. I think, I think, like, you know, you don't have to spin it both ways to have variation. I think that changing your pace, you know, that's uh, something that in theory shouldn't be too hard to do. So I think, you know, if you're listening, you're going, you know, even as a thing spinner, if you're only an off spinner, say, you know, the dark art, then um, you still can change things up a lot. And I think that's a really key, key message for all spinners. There's no, you know, it's obviously good to be able to spin it both ways and it is a strength, but it's not something to completely obsess over if you can't do it or you, you struggle to do it. Yeah, if you've got a really fantastic leg spinner, why not ball that all the time, you know? And I think that's where having to read batsmen and having to have my analysis done and stuff is really come into play in that I don't have a plan B to fall back on of the ball that turns the other way. You know, I've got to think of other ways to get them out. So it might be I change my approach, I might jump wider in the crease, I might come around the wicket. You know, it's just all these little natural things you can change that's not actually a big um, strain on your training or having to learn it. You know, it's just something that's really easily changeable. Um, and, you know, as a spinner, a quick change of flight or a change of pace is what does as most nine times out of ten, I reckon. Um, so why not 
just focus on those little things first and then you know as a junior cricket obviously mm -hmm. try and progress up to this been in it both ways and all those sort of things but um don't like hone in and that you have to be a spinner that turns it both ways and to be a successful spinner because I've got a fair few wickets to turn it one way. <laughs> Definitely, that's for sure. Um, you know, you spoke there about changing your angles as well, and I think that's the same as pace. That's something that is, you know, pretty straightforward to change. Um, I'm gonna put you, just thinking, I'm going to put you on the spot a bit here. So, but for me, um, being able to spin it both ways, the time when that's best is bowling to a left-hander. If they're, you know, trying to line me up, and especially in short form cricket, if they're going to come hard, you know, that's when it's you know, a really good ball to have because I can spin the ball away from them. So, like, say if you're bowling to a left-hander and you think, you know, they're trying to hit you long on, you know, um, demon wicket, you know, what will you do to try and make that harder? Yeah, so, um, depending on the batsman, but usually my go-to is chucking it really wide of off and almost yorking, because so usually I'm only playing limited over stuff, yeah. so it's white ball cricket. So I always try and... Um, chuck it wider and fuller and almost yorking, you know, off, off side line. And because a left hander traditionally loves to get you over to cow, over to long on, and it's a much harder shot to pull me from wider. So my go to usually is to try and throw it really far across them and see what the driving's all about. Um, so yeah, I try that first. I'll come around the wicket after if that's not going to plan. Yeah. Try and get a nicer yeah. angle um, for turning in onto the pads. But yeah, I'd always chuck it wider uh, of off and fuller as my go-to. No, I think that's a good option. I think, you know, again, it just shows, you know, if you really think about it, you know, you don't have to spin it both ways to have, have really good, clear plans um, for any situation, really. Um, so you spoke there about, like, the um, women's coaching and stuff, and I think just from a purely selfish point of view, like, I think coaching in the women's game is, is something I, I think I find quite interesting and would be keen to do in the future. You know, what do you think? You know, for a coach coming into the women's game, like what are the key things that they should do when, you know, um, coaching young female cricketers? I think do your homework on the women's game, first and foremost. I think a lot of, historically, it's a lot better now that coaches would have only experience in the men's game or watch the men's game and then come across to us and what they're saying doesn't necessarily translate. You know, yeah. even there's, there's little things like how many fielders you can have out and yeah. stuff. I, well my plan's not going to work to that when I've only got yeah. four out <laughs> um, and just yeah just do your homework in the women's game and ultimately don't treat us any different to the guys you know we want to learn just as much um, as the lads do we've just not had access to it um, working for a coaching company and speaking to those guys and then working with me now they've um, they always say that they find the women are, and girls are a lot more receptive to coaching because they've generally not had it or had access to it. I've so we want to that that when, I've, um, when I've done some coaching of like women's cricket, I found like they are so much more willing to listen and stuff. Like it's it's really great. Yeah, you if you can tell us anything, like we'll take it in and we love it because we know we've not traditionally had access to that. So um, I think yeah, just do your homework and acknowledge it. It's a separate game in its own right um, and it has its own tactics and its own um, game plans and that we just really want good coaches, really. <laughs> nice. Um, so going back to your own bowling, like um, you said you have quite an unconventional action, you know, like just interested in that. So, you know, for example, like your grip, like is your grip kind of normal? Do you hold it like on the seam, cross seam? Yeah, so, I mean, it's quite difficult to describe, isn't it? But um, it's fairly traditional in that it's just my main two fingers across the seam um, with my ring finger, would you call it? Yes, sort of finger, yeah. tucked, tucked in underneath purely for um, just a little bit of support. But then um, I tend to click with my thumb and my finger um, somehow, every so often when I'm bowling. Don't know how it does it. Yeah. Um, but it's audible to the batters, the non-strikers, and they can hear when I click. Um, so, yeah, I think it's fairly, fairly traditional. Um, although, again, not having had access to loads of coaching, I'd probably find out I'm actually doing it wrong all these years. <laughs> that, well, it's still been working. Um, so I spoke about an instruction that, you know, well, hopefully last year, um, well, last year, um, you know, should have been the first year of 100, and that's actually next year. So, obviously... Um, really exciting time for, for men and women's cricket and um, with that coming in and something that everyone wants to be involved in. 
uh, you're going to be playing for the Northern Superchargers. You know, what? obviously there's a few different rules in the 100. So, you know, you could bowl as five ball overs, you could bowl 10 balls in a row, all these different things. Like, you know, have you sat down and, and thought about the different tactics in the 100 yet? And, you know, how do you, how do you see those working out from like a spin point of view? Yeah, I can't say it's something um, verbally thought about yet in terms of tactics. I think the main thing a lot of people are forgetting with the 100 is it is still just cricket and um, it's just 20 balls fewer than most of the women have been playing all our lives, you know. And that was the main thing when I was talking to coaches about joining teams, you know, they kept just saying it's just 20 balls less, don't think of it as any different. And um, obviously there's slightly different rules with the fives and tens, but um, I played in the, the first ever warm up uh, trial games a couple of years ago at Loughborough um, when they were trialing out the new rules and stuff. And I was the first person to bowl five from one end and go and bowl five immediately from the other end. And as a bowler, that felt fantastic in that, you know, when you're on top of a batsman and they're really struggling and they're looking for that one and they can't get it. And then she eventually got off strike, the last ball of the over. And then I just went to the other end and just ruined the world and came on for another five. <laughs> like that actually felt like for once the bowlers had a bit of power. And um, so that was a rule I really enjoyed and look forward to hopefully doing. Um, ten in a row will be interesting. Um, I think, I mean, watch Seamers do it. I think it's going to fall on spinners a lot to do the 10 because it looked a struggle um, those last couple of balls for the seamers. So it's looking forward to seeing the tactics. I think it'll take a few years for it to fully play out and, you know, for people to fully start taking advantage of these different rules. But just for now, my mindset is it's just cricket and it's just 20 fewer balls. So it's just doing your skill um, in a quicker time. Yeah, I think actually, well, I hope they all suit spinners quite a lot. You know, like you said, if you if you get a wicket and you get a new batter or, you know, like you said, you're on top of a player, then I think it's great. You can bowl 10 balls in a row and probably the other way as well. Like, you know, if you're having a bit of a mare and you're getting lined up, it's one less ball, I guess, to kind of get through. So, you know, hopefully, um, well, I guess, especially from a selfish point of view, there's a lot of um, spin is really successful in the 100, which, you know, I think just thinking about it, 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 I can't see why it wouldn't be, you know, same as T20 cricket. I think it will lend itself really well to, to good spinners. Um, yeah, I think especially in the women's game as well, spinners, we can often be the person they want to just see off and they just want to just get through your over. And then if you can prolong that over or you can come around the other end and prolong their yeah. um, struggle, I think that will be um, a real bonus for the spinners, you know, that we can stay on top of the game a bit more. You don't have to wait another over before I can come back on and continue, you know, you can just stay on them and I think it will quite quite a lot of pressure uh, on the batsman. Uh, if you get yourself into a hole, it'll probably be quite difficult to get out, not knowing when that's going to end. You know, it's not a traditional, right, I'm having an absolute stink of this over. I've just got to get through these six balls. You know, it could go on or it could continue from the other end. So I think that will be a plus for us spinners, I hope, anyway. Definitely. And just thinking out loud, you know, it might mean that players have to take more risks in your five balls because they know if they just kind of knock it around, they might get you for another five. So. Yeah, exactly. You can't just see off a bowler anymore and think, right, okay, she's not my strength. I yeah. just need to get through this. You know, it could go on for 10 balls a long time in cricket, especially in the 100 when that's a tenth of your innings gone, potentially. Definitely. And you have to look in the, in the kind of male um, player draft. You know, there are so many, especially overseas, um, well, wrist spinners in particular are picked up. So I'd imagine like the coaches and... Um, you know, the kind of people making the decisions are, are thinking the same thing, that, you know, spinning is going to be a massive part of it. Yeah, I think it's the same in the women's game as well, in that the 100, although we didn't do a traditional draft um, like the guys, um, it was an open field the first year to talk with whoever you want. And, you know, having discussions with quite a few teams, they were all projecting the same thing to me, that, you know, that leggies and wrist spinners are so important in the game. And if we can get that nailed on, that's a, such a big part of our game plan, you know, that you want a top quality person in that role. Um, and it just shows that I think in, in both formats, men's and women's, that the emphasis is on spin. So see how that plays out next year. Definitely. Um, again, putting you on the spot here, because I didn't um, think we'd talk about this, but just again, thinking out loud, you know, there's a lot of, um, it seems just from looking um, outside in, there's a lot of really good um, female spinners in England at the moment, um, especially like Sophie Eccleston's been doing a really good job for England. You know, what do you think makes her such a good bowler? Um, yeah, Eccles has been around for quite a few years to say how young she is, and I think people forget that, but 
it's similar to me in that her action is just so repeatable and it's just so natural and so easy that she's not going to generally give you a bad ball, you know. She's not going to have the one that comes out wrong and drag massively short generally. Um, she turns it a lot as well, which, again, I've touched on earlier. I think it just should be the main thing for spinners. Um, and she's just a really attacking um, bowler and a competitor, you know. Um, you know, as soon as she turns up, she's in the fight um, and she'll be in your face. And I think that's a good trait to have as a spinner. And she's just, I think, will continue to dominate for quite a few years. Yeah, definitely. No, she's doing really well. Um, right, so finishing off, uh, Lev. So I've asked all the guests so far for, for one tip um, for young spinners on the field and one off the field. What would be yours? Probably really cliche, but um, on the field, just enjoy it. Um, you know, bowling spin and especially leg spin and wrist spin can be such a, a thankless task and you are going to go around the park and just in, enjoy it and enjoy the battle. I find that I'm at my at ease the most and most calm when I'm just having fun and enjoying it with my mates. And if you're enjoying it, you want to do well and you probably will do well. You know, there'll be no stresses in your body that's uh, making you like tie it up or um you know ruin your action just really enjoy the moment because also careers are so short for sport and it feels like when you're in it it's going on forever um but you're a long time retired when you finish in your 30s generally and um the games i remember and the performances i remember are always the ones that i enjoyed the most with my friends you know winning obviously is enjoyable um but if you can't enjoy every moment like what are you playing the game for my, I think I was quite lucky in that my parents always told me um, as soon as you stop enjoying it, stop playing. You know, there was no pressure on me from that point of view. I think they thought I would have stopped a long time before now, um, but I am still just enjoying it. I even said this year with the Northern Diamonds that I sort of got that spark back and that I enjoyed being around that team so much and that environment. Um, it's given me the want to keep going on for a few years and to keep developing myself in a career I thought was winding down. So I think just enjoyment is the main thing absolutely for me that's good to hear um yeah well fingers crossed that you keep going for many many years Lev. and i guess that's would that be kind of similar to your off the field tip as well um it sort of probably links in in that i think realizing the impact you can have on a changing room is just as important as on the pitch um and how you are in the environment and how you are as a player and a person um I always remember when you did the Masterclass for Pro Coach, you touched on um, being a good person and being a good team player. And I think that's something that can get forgotten when you're trying so hard with your skills. But if you're bringing a good vibe and you're a good personality to have around the team, that can be so beneficial to the rest of the team without you even realising. Um, I've always been sort of the jokey one in the change room and I've tried to lift spirits and you don't realise that if by you just sat joking around and talking rubbish for a few hours is calming down the batsmen before they go in then you've done a job and you know places competition for places can be so competitive and sometimes it does come down to you know what are they like around the team and what are they bringing to us other than their skills and just being a, a good teammate and a good person I hope um, is something I'll be remembered for as well as my skills and I think it's just something so important to remember that cricket is a very singular sport but it's also a team sport on the whole and never underestimate the um, effect that your um, your personality and your vibe can give off in, in a room and affects the team's performances as well. Definitely I don't like those last two tips you shared are probably like massive beliefs beliefs of mine and and things I really you know think are, are crucial so couldn't really put those um, better myself, but thanks, Lev. Like um, so many amazing bits of insight there, really enjoyed that. Um, so yeah, so thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on.